Hi Binansians and welcome to our August market update. You've asked for it and so we are delivering. This is the first time we're giving our update via video, so please let us know how we go in the comments. To dive into August, I'm joined by our Binance Australia CEO, Lee Travers. Welcome, Lee. Thank you very much, glad to be here. And we'll be talking about all of the important developments in crypto from the month of August. First up, Lee, the Reserve Bank announced they are collaborating with the Digital Finance CRC to explore use cases for a central bank digital currency in Australia. What could this mean for our Australian users? Firstly, I think every major central bank is experimenting, is researching with blockchain-based money, this central bank digital currency, and it's great, great to see the RBA doing the same. I think fundamentally, uh, the more consumers in Australia become familiar with digital money, the more they can understand digital money like Bitcoin, like Ether. And, and fundamentally, there's a very different value proposition from Bitcoin and Ether to a fiat-based digital currency. So I think more acceptance, more understanding, greater use, and a greater opportunity to have a look into these uh, fantastic products. So with this particular uh, experiment from the RBA, I think it's very early stage. I don't even think they're deciding which blockchain they're going to use and, and things like that. Um, I also think they're going to be relatively slow to, to innovate. The private sector is moving very, very quickly. We've seen product market fit for digital money now, the stable coins. We've got billions of dollars being transferred daily. You know, BUSD, USD Tether, USDC, they're all in market at the moment. They have product market fit and they're working quite well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see when central bank digital currency starts to hit the market as well, but I still feel like it's years away. The new Labor government also just announced a review of crypto assets in the country to better understand and regulate the industry. What is token mapping and why is it important? assets, blockchain, digital money, and I think that's really good to see. It's a relatively short period of time since they've come into office, and they're picking up where the last government left. Uh, we were previously consulting, obviously, with how digital currency exchanges would be licensed, how custody for digital assets would be licensed, and now we're introducing token mapping. So what that's telling me is they're going a different approach, and potentially exchanges licensing and custody licensing will be a bit longer, but it may be more thorough. They are taking industry consultation. So that's a great thing for Australian blockchain-based businesses to come in and effectively have their say. And that certainly makes sense with respect to token mapping. Understanding you know, which tokens are payment currencies, which tokens are security tokens, which are asset-backed tokens, which are stable coins. And, and from our perspective, I think, the more clarity around that and the more education understanding, the better. Uh, fundamentally, these assets are, are very different from, say, uh, equities, which are traded on the ASX. So we believe that ASX, NSX, SSX, etc., that have these market licenses, they should be licensed differently from a digital currency exchange that would only offer the ability to trade spot and cryptocurrencies. So I think it's quite good to go down that path to get the consultation and certainly we're very happy to contribute and support that endeavour. Coinbase announced a partnership with BlackRock to provide institutional clients with direct access to crypto, starting with Bitcoin. How are Australian institutions currently accessing digital assets and where do you see this moving in the coming months? Well, I think institutions are a very broad term. What we've seen in Australia is it's predominantly the smaller institutions, the family offices. We haven't yet seen you know, retail super funds. Uh, we haven't seen the major banks start to trade cryptocurrencies, custody cryptos yet. And I think fundamentally it's because there isn't that custody licensing regime and there isn't the exchange licensing regime like we've seen in the US. Um, and that's mean even pilots where we saw with the CBA, they were looking at using a US-based exchange for custody because they had that, that requirement. So I think the Australian institutions uh, are still waiting for a bit more regulatory clarity. Um, I think 
some of the exchanges globally that were probably calling these institutions probably should have managed themselves a little bit better. Uh, and, and now what we're seeing is you know, some of the world's largest institutions, BlackRock, if they're entering, I think the time for mainstream institutional adoption is here. We just need more regulatory clarity to enable the Australian institutions to come in. And for now, it's, uh, I think, more of a momentum piece. We're seeing some, but yeah, we need to see a lot more. Meta, or Facebook, is readying its NFT play, and Instagram users in certain countries can now be able to showcase their NFTs on platform. Will you be changing your profile picture? And how do you see this adoption of NFTs impacting popularity in the short term? In terms of the new PSP for me, well, I just updated my Twitter profile yesterday with our Adelaide meetup with Stefan, his Binance branded shirt, so <laughs> I'll keep that for a little while. Um, in terms of what we're seeing in Australia, it's probably other regions that have, that have led NFT adoption. The other thing is sport NFTs are coming. Uh, we saw the Australian Open uh, last year. We've just seen the AFL. Uh, they've had their first NFT drop. I think with sport, Australians resonate with that. They understand that there's communities around sport teams, around sporting leagues. Mm. I think that's going to make a big difference over the next year. Um, and I think there's also quite a lot of variance within NFTs. It's not just profile pictures. You know, we're seeing some NFTs, for example, that by holding them, by interacting with them, utilizing them, you receive you know, tokens that are within a game that you'll be able to use as well. So they have emissions for holding them, so they're actually generating an income. Mm. I, I think that sort of understanding where we can see them moving from just a, a single piece of art to look at to being an income generating asset with zero holding cost that's going to start to, to really change the game for NFTs. Crypto bros are famous for trying to impress women in bars by showing them screenshots of their overpriced JPEGs. And I think for the most part, they fail badly. Um, Tiffany & Co this month became the latest big brand to launch an NFT collection, uh, which was accompanied by a luxury pendant in the same design. They were priced at 30 Ethereum each, and the collection sold out in 20 minutes, netting $12.5 million in revenue. Lee, are the wives of crypto bros around the world finally starting to get it? Well, if they're getting 30 F presents, I think they're gonna get it. <laughs> I think they're gonna be pretty happy with it too. <laughs> but, uh, but seriously, I, I do think the mainstream moment or when the average person in Australia starts to get it is probably gonna come from some of these consumer brands that are getting into NFTs. Well, one of the more successful ones um, in line with Tiffany was obviously Adidas. Um, they've had a ton of secondary interest as well, um, which sort of follows the success they've had in you know, the real world, in the traditional world with sneakers and other um, sort of sporting goods. Um, I think for Australia, you know, we're in discussions with some of the more important and more influential Australian brands and, and they're looking at ways to have a Web3 strategy to offer NFTs to their community, um, and hopefully that can sort of be another another line in the sand for you know, Australia's adoption of that. After a solid run-up in August, digital asset prices have definitely softened in the last week. What are you seeing in the market? What we've seen is obviously following the European summer. You know, some of the markets have been a little bit quieter. For example, the private markets. We haven't seen as many of those multi-billion dollar funds being launched as we had sort of earlier in the year. So private markets, they've been quieter. Um, market's been a little bit softer over the last week, but it's generally been a, a much better month uh, from the lows. So we've seen some relatively stronger rallies, uh, particularly in line with say the ETH merge, the narrative around that, the positive development we've seen there. Um, we've also seen maybe some investors positioning for the ability to get an additional forks coin through that, um, and maybe some of the derivative market activity sort of highlights towards that. Doesn't look like it's you know overblown from a speculative point of view. Um, certainly, investors are probably positioning more in the spot than they are in derivatives, so they can potentially take advantage of that that forks coin. Um, but I, I do see as well some of those forced liquidations we had from some of those crypto institutions that were over leveraged, um, that stopped, that stopped predominantly. 
Um, so yeah, the market's returned to normal and I think provided we get some generally positive macro, yeah, things are looking okay. As further Web3 companies announced staff cuts this month, uh, we actually saw Apple is seeking a Web3 savvy marketer. Uh, they were advertising multiple roles with demonstrated interest in Web3 and interactive platforms. Lee, what are your thoughts on the turbulent Web3 uh, market for talent at the moment and what are the opportunities for Australians to join Web3 companies like Binance? Yeah, I think the, the Web3 market has seen exceptional growth over the last one to two years. It's honestly been one of the fastest growing markets out there. Um, maybe grew a little bit too quick um, and spending was a bit too high. So we've seen that cool recently and, and unfortunately have seen some job losses in the industry, which uh, hopefully will be short term. Um, but still the trajectory of, say, ex-regulators still seems to be into crypto firms rather than where they'd previously go to, to banks. Um, so that's a really positive sign. I think we've had some growth as well from some traditional compliance firms, um, from some traditional Web2 marketing firms into Binance Australia. So yeah, that's that's been a really positive development. Uh, I still think if you can combine your skills that you have in Web2 and, and bring them into the Web3 world, um, you can help consumers understand digital assets, uh, you can explain things clearly, and you've got a genuine opinion passion for the industry uh, that's still just available, um, even during this five period. And finally, on uh, Ethereum and the merge, uh, we do finally have a date which has been tentatively locked in for mid-September. It might actually be the weekend that we're at the Australian Crypto Convention, so we might be able to have a merge party there and enjoy a couple of Vitalik Buterans. So uh, we are doing a more detailed piece on the merge. Stay tuned for that. But that is our August wrap. Thanks so much for joining me and we will see you soon. Thank you.